Like the cold open of a thriller, Whiplash starts with an introduction to the villain and a small preview of his cruelty. In as few words as possible, we learn that Andrew is practicing drums in the right place at the right time, hoping Fletcher shows up. Today, he does, and Andrew has only moments to impress him. But we quickly learn that his approval is not easily won, and in fact may be impossible to win. Andrew is chastised for having stopped playing, and then insulted for correcting that by continuing to play. Did I ask you to start playing again? Uh, Fletcher gives him a couple of instructions, and while Andrew tries to execute, the door slams shut, until the conductor returns, but only because he forgot his coat. Fletcher will give you chances, but only fleeting ones, and he'll go out of his way to be cruel, and he leaves Andrew without an answer. Did he make enough of an impression? Does he have a shot at joining the Schaefer Conservatory studio band? He knows it'll kill Andrew to wait, but leaves him dangling regardless. When the invitation finally comes, Andrew is made the alternate for core drummer Carl Tanner, and he gets to bear witness to what's in store for him. Fletcher notices an out-of-tune instrument and demands the offender make themselves known. When they don't, he has each section of the band play just long enough for him to detect if the culprit is among them. Damien Chazelle wrote this movie as a thriller, and this scene especially plays like one. For me, it's just as tense as the blood test scene from The Thing, where they know one of them is a monster in disguise, and they devise a test to identify him. One by one, characters are eliminated, as they narrow in on the imposter. The stakes in Whiplash aren't life or death, but for Andrew and the rest of the cast, They may as well be, because we know that Fletcher's approval means everything. We know that anyone in their school band who cares about excelling would kill for the chance to play with him. And even if we can't relate personally, Andrew has already won our sympathies. The first sequence tells us he's a hard worker, and he's victimized but doesn't crumble in defeat. The second is one we can all relate to, wanting to ask someone out but not finding the courage. And the third shows Andrew's kindness to his dad, putting raisinets in their shared popcorn even though he doesn't like them but knows his dad does. I just eat around them. By the time we get to the who's out of tune sequence, we like Andrew. We want him to succeed. So as Fletcher becomes more and more of a monster, tensions rise knowing Andrew will soon have to face him. Think back to any experience you've had where someone else's approval is important. Maybe a school presentation. As you wait your turn, you watch how the teacher will react to prior students' work. Maybe they pepper the students with way more questions than you expected. Maybe they are way more critical than you expected, bordering on cruel. You watch and wait, knowing that soon it'll be your turn. It's a fear we can all relate to, and we remember that, at the time, the stakes certainly felt like life or death. It doesn't take long for Fletcher to find the culprit. With obscenities and slurs, he shreds Metz to pieces before sending him out in tears. Then Fletcher reveals Metz wasn't the one playing out of tune, but when he asked if he was in tune or not, like a deer in headlights, Metz wasn't sure. Not knowing is bad enough so he had to go. Yet Wallach, who was playing out of tune, gets to stay. Why? Because this was just a demonstration of his impossibly high standards, his power, and the cost of failure. For any SawCast fans watching, this is the Gus Fring box cutter scene. After the demonstration, Fletcher tells Andrew that in 10 minutes, it's his turn. Every good suspense writer knows that suspense is all in the anticipation. That's why Michael Myers always stalks his prey before killing them. It draws out the clock, giving us a chance to hope for survival and, more importantly, worry about death. So it's not Andrew's turn yet. Instead, Chazelle sets a ticking clock, so we have a chance to wonder, is Andrew about to suffer the same fate as Metz? Maybe a worse fate? Or... Will he survive the encounter stronger? During the break, Fletcher takes Andrew aside and tells him how Charlie Parker became Bird. Jones threw a symbol at his head. He says it with a smile and even offers some words of encouragement. The key is to just relax. Don't worry about the numbers. Don't worry about what the other guys are thinking. 
You're here for a reason. But we've already seen how manipulative Fletcher can be, calling out the wrong student for playing out of tune, or in an earlier scene, when he has Ryan and Andrew both play for him, he announces, Drums with me. Knowing Ryan will interpret that as being for him, only for his hopes to be dashed seconds later. No, 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 other drums. So when Fletcher builds Andrew up in this scene, we know it might just be to tear him down moments later. Maybe all that really came from this conversation and the Charlie Parker story is that public humiliation isn't Fletcher's only weapon. Physical assault apparently is not off the table. The threat grows as Andrew's turn rapidly approaches. And his first attempt goes about as well as you'd expect. Fletcher throws a chair at him, slaps him, humiliates him, and leaves him in tears. Whiplash is about Andrew Naiman's attempt to become one of the greats in his field. But how do you know when you've accomplished that? It's a nebulous goal, where you don't know if you've succeeded until decades later, when the question is answered. Do people you'll never meet discuss you around the dinner table? So Chazelle makes the goal more concrete, by making Terence Fletcher the arbiter of greatness. And by conflating Fletcher's approval with that nebulous goal, Whiplash does what good art so often does. It gives shape to an idea. In the same way you might think of Rocky Balboa for motivation when you're training for a physical feat, you might now think of Terence Fletcher as a check on your ambition, a reminder to ask some questions. Why are you trying to be the best? Is it just for the approval of others? And ultimately, do you really know the cost? And are you prepared to pay it? One question you may have is why? Why is Andrew so fixated on being the next great drummer? There are some hints in Andrew's relationship with his father. At the movies, when someone bumps into his dad, his dad is the one who apologizes. Sorry. You can imagine Andrew sees his father as meek and wants to be more than that. When Andrew tells him about the disappointing encounter with Fletcher earlier, his father reassures him that he always has other options. As an older man, he's gained perspective. Andrew scoffs at all of it. You can imagine Andrew sees his father as someone who settles for whatever he can get. Andrew revolts against that idea. He will not settle for anything less than perfection. During that scene in the hallway where Fletcher reassures Andrew, you can see some of those insecurities at play. It takes a moment for him to admit to his dad's actual profession. My uh, dad's a, a writer. Oh, what's he written? Uh, I guess he's, he's more of a teacher. College. Pennington High School. Originally, Chazelle tried to be more explicit with what actually drove Andrew to drumming. He considered including a flashback to a young Andrew watching a drummer give a speech that inspires him. But it felt phony, so Chazelle took it out. Reflecting on his own experience, he realized that he can't remember ever not wanting to make movies. I think the reality is that we all feel a tug towards something bigger. We've all wondered if we could do something important. But for some, that impulse is stronger than others. And we all make different calculations, whether consciously or not, where it ranks among our other priorities. Do you try to be the best in your career? Or do you put all your efforts into raising a family? Do you spend your free time practicing? Or do you spend it hanging out with friends? Do you sleep and take care of yourself? Or do you keep training? Being the best requires those sacrifices. Because if you don't make them, someone else will. And suddenly, you're not the best anymore. Many movies have explored similar themes, but they usually focus on the benefits and take for granted that the price is worth paying. No one watches Rocky and thinks, eh, he shouldn't have bothered training so hard. But the truth is, there is a cost to being great, and there is certainly a cost to being the greatest. I used to work with financial models where you input some numbers and get some output. If it was a new model and I wanted to understand how it works, I'd sometimes enter extremely high numbers, so the outputs are exaggerated. That way it becomes very easy to see how changing one input will affect the output. That's what Whiplash does. In role-playing game terms, it takes Andrew Naiman's ambition attribute and sets it at the max level, taking things too far to amplify the results and make the costs clear. And by using drumming as Andrew's artistic pursuit, it becomes cinematic. 
When Andrew gives himself up to his art, it's visually exciting. The quick beats trick your heart into matching pace, and it's violent. You can imagine a movie about a writer or painter with similarly impossibly high ambitions. And I can imagine calloused and cramping hands. But Andrew attacks his drums. He bleeds, sweats, and cries on them. It reminds me of Black Swan. Ballet is another art form where the physical toll of practice requires little exaggeration to be cinematic, though Aronofsky definitely brought his brand of horror and surrealism to take things even further. Both of these movies show the work more than most others. And that's not to put other movies down. The point is that Whiplash focuses on the work because it's not about being great. It's about the cost of being great. And what is the cost? Whatever Andrew believes it to be, he's wrong. Because it grows throughout the movie. At first, he thinks he's given enough, until he realizes he's losing time to transportation. So he starts sleeping in the training room. That still, apparently, is not enough. So he dumps the girl he once pined after. And even giving up all his time isn't enough. He has to take risks, too. When he forgets his sticks, Andrew drives recklessly to get them and ends up in a car crash. Rather than get help, he stumbles a bloody mess back to the auditorium. If, at first, someone showed Andrew where his pursuit would take him, he might have said, it's not worth the cost. But that's not how it works. It creeps in on him. As Chazelle said in Filmmaker Magazine, to me, it was almost a three-act thing in the sense that it's just about a kid who is becoming more and more obsessed and addicted to this drug. Fletcher's approval is so hard to obtain, every time he gives even an inch, it's intoxicating, tempting Andrew to give up more in the hope of moving another inch. But it isn't just time, comfort, and health that Andrew gives up. There's also inherent potential for cruelty in his pursuit. Freeing time and removing distractions means pushing people out of your life. And we see Andrew embrace this philosophy over the course of his three face-to-face -face interactions with Nicole. First, he's a wide-eyed Andrew, seeking her approval. At their second encounter, on their first date, he's gained some confidence and talks in a way to unintentionally put her down. He's so certain about what he wants from his future and is surprised when she chose Fordham for no particular reason, other than they were the school that let her in. He's surprised she hasn't picked a major and doesn't know what she wants to do with her life. His surprise at her lack of direction comes off as judgment, but he reins himself in. When she talks about feeling homesick, they bond over attachment to their families. But by the third time we see them meet, Andrew has become a mini Fletcher, even starting to dress more like him, wearing a black t-shirt. Something Chazelle has mentioned was intentional, citing Luke Skywalker in Star Wars wearing black by the end of the original trilogy, as he gets closer and closer to the dark side. That was the director's first time as a child noticing symbolism in a movie. So Andrew Naiman takes after Darth Vader and Terrence Fletcher, bluntly ending things with Nicole, because he knows he will want to prioritize drumming. He'll feel she's in the way of that, and they'll grow to resent each other. So instead, he unsympathetically ends the relationship. If all you care about is being great, you can't waste a second on other people, and you can't bother with politeness and niceties, because who cares? If there's no room for people in your life, there's no cost to pushing them away. Instead, you can say, or yell, whatever you think will most effectively clear the path between you and greatness. So Andrew continues his transformation into Fletcher Jr., talking to his peers the same curse-laden, insulting way that Fletcher does. God, it's fucking dead. Okay, you just tell that little fucking redhead I'm, I'm gonna be there, okay? Get fucked. Oh, he's playing the part. Yeah, like fucking hell he's playing my part. Look, why don't you just tell Fletcher that I'm coming, you motherfucker! At the dinner table, Andrew's extended family, unfamiliar with the world of jazz, fails to recognize and appreciate his recent successes. So he insecurely lashes out with insults. Oh, that's what this is all about? You think you're better than us? Catch on quick, you model you in? I got a reply for you, Andrew. You think Carlton football's a joke? Come play with us. 
four words you will never hear from the NFL. It's a far cry from the Andrew we met earlier, eating around raisinets in the shared tub of popcorn between him and his dad. The cost of being the best is everything, because you can always sacrifice more until there's nothing left to give. There's a deleted scene where we spend a few minutes with Fletcher at home, alone. J.K. Simmons described it in his interview with That Shelf. We shot a half a day of scenes in Fletcher's apartment, again, most of which aren't in the movie, where we see just how Spartan his existence is. It's a nice apartment, but the one time we see him, he's drinking a glass of wine with a frozen microwave dinner, eating by himself. He's a sad guy, and the only thing he has in his life is the music. At the end of that sequence, we showed me exercising and being obsessive about things around the house. The last thing is me putting on an old jazz record from 1938, and letting that wash over me and absorb me. You can easily imagine a similar scene set decades later, showing the future that awaits Andrew. Maybe he's the best, but when he's not playing drums, he's utterly alone. There is nothing else in his life, and that may be the best case scenario. There's also Sean Casey. He's Terrence Fletcher's old student, a kid who barely squeaked into studio band, but in him, Fletcher saw drive. Casey eventually became first trumpet at Lincoln Center, but the pressure which got him there also cost him dearly. Fletcher tells his students Casey died in a car accident, but later we learn the truth. He took his own life. After getting the news, Fletcher puts his three drummers through hell, making them try over and over to get his tempo, making the rest of the band wait until late into the night. It's physically grueling and psychologically manipulative, making everyone else in the band resent the drummers for keeping them from leaving. All this is in Fletcher's wheelhouse. His entire philosophy is the polar opposite of coddling. He crushes his students to forge talent, but it's also one of the more extreme examples. So you have to wonder if Fletcher is also using his students as a punching bag. He just learned that he drove one of his students to suicide, and though he's cruel, Fletcher is not a sociopath. He was clearly pained by the news, but as a man who has become isolated and obsessively focused only on his pursuit of forging the next great musician, he has no one to talk to and no healthy outlet for his grief and guilt. Instead, he works it out of his system by torturing Ryan, Carl, and Andrew. Just prior to this, we see Andrew similarly struggle to process his emotions. After breaking up with Nicole, he has a particularly violent practice session, which ends with him punching his fist through a drum. There's clearly self-loathing in this scene. Where Andrew isn't entirely happy about what he did to Nicole, he's angry at himself, he's angry at Fletcher for effectively making him do it, and he's angry that excellence seems to always be a few inches before him, just out of reach. The path to greatness, if taken too far, is clearly a self-destructive one. So, the price is high. But what exactly are you buying? What are the benefits to being the best? The truth is, Whiplash doesn't spend a lot of time on this question. In part, I think that's because the answers are sort of obvious and self-explanatory. It's human nature that we enjoy being held in high regard, and it's comforting to know you're leaving some lasting impression on the world. But these reasons are pretty ambiguous. The movie hashes it out during that dinner scene between Andrew and his family. I think being the greatest musician of the 20th century is anybody's idea of success. Dying broke and drunk and full of heroin at the age of 34 is not exactly my idea of success. I'd rather die drunk, broke at 34 and have people at a dinner table talk about me than live to be rich and sober at 90 and nobody remember who I was. It seems that there are no real tangible benefits to being one of the greats. It may not even guarantee financial security if it's a field where talent is not necessarily recognized or appreciated by the public at large. If you take Andrew's goal literally, he's saying that he wants people to recognize him as the best. Terrence Fletcher is just one representative of that nebulous group. Once you realize this, it puts a damper on the whole thing. It makes Andrew's pursuit feel just as hollow as someone chasing celebrity for its own sake. There's little discussion in the movie about the actual beauty and art of music, and there are few examples of anyone actually enjoying music. Instead, it's mostly treated as only a technical pursuit, that you either do correctly or not. Here's another moment from that dinner scene. How do you, how do you know when's an end? Music competition, isn't it subjective? No. 
Travis is, of course, oversimplifying and in some ways belittling something very meaningful to Andrew. But there is also some truth to it. Andrew seems to have forgotten the subjects to his music. People. For most of us, music is not an end in itself. It's something that moves us, the same way stories can. It's something we enjoy. It's something that motivates us or comforts us. But in Whiplash, it is an end in itself. The music is being performed not for the sake of an audience or even for the person playing it, but for the sake of performing it more correctly than the other guy. In the sequence where Fletcher tries getting one of his three drummers to play his tempo, just look at Andrew's subtle smile when Ryan messes up. Andrew takes pleasure not just from his own success, but also the failure of others. So when you consider Andrew's goals and try to define them tangibly, they start to feel a little silly. He is sacrificing his health and relationships, so people he'll never know will talk about him at a dinner table one day, alongside names like Charlie Parker. To be clear, I'm not saying that it's all cons and there are no pros. We've all felt the inspiration that comes from seeing someone perfect their craft. If Andrew does become the best, he likely would put something positive into the world. But as I mentioned before, the upside to all this is well-trodden ground in other stories, so it's hardly explored in this one. Whiplash clearly has a lot more to say about the sacrifices involved and the question not often asked in these stories. Is it worth it? Andrew's obsession reaches a fever pitch when we watch him stumble out of a car accident and try to play despite serious injuries. But of course, he finds no sympathy from Fletcher, gets pushed too far, and actually attacks him, getting him kicked out of the band. Earlier, I quoted Chazelle comparing Andrew's pursuit to drug addiction. In the same interview, he continued, saying how eventually things go too far, and Andrew tries to live sober for a while. That's what happens after this scene. Andrew's father introduces him to a lawyer who would like his cooperation in exposing Fletcher's abusive behavior. Their conversation is intercut with a scene of Andrew watching home video of himself playing drums as a child, likely remembering when it used to be fun, a newly discovered passion he enjoyed, before it became an albatross around his neck. Forced to pause from drumming, Andrew has a chance to take stock of all he lost to Fletcher, and he agrees to work with the lawyer. He seems ready to leave that life behind. He saw the price and decided to stop paying it. Soon, he's having popcorn with his dad again, and he's thinking about Nicole. Though clearly, something is missing, and one night, he finds Fletcher playing at a jazz club. Over drinks, Fletcher defends his methods. He was trying to push people beyond what's expected of them. That is an absolute necessity. Otherwise, you're depriving the world of the next Louis Armstrong or Charlie Parker. He sums up his philosophy. There are no two words in the English language more harmful than good job. Andrew asks if you can go too far. What if you push so hard you discourage the next Charlie Parker from ever becoming Charlie Parker? Fletcher won't even entertain the idea. The next Charlie Parker would never be discouraged. In the exploration over how much is worth giving in pursuit of greatness, this is the movie's final defense of Fletcher's position. And it is compelling. I don't think you can say Fletcher is wrong in his philosophy, because pushing people beyond what they think they are capable of has undoubtedly made some people better. But his methods are unequivocally wrong. They drove one person to suicide, Andrew ended up playing drums with broken bones before physically assaulting his teacher, and Fletcher himself lost his job. The point is, there is a line, which Fletcher crossed. What Whiplash doesn't tell us directly, but asks us to think about, is where is that line? And more specifically, where is that line for you? The conversation ends when Fletcher bemoans, The truth is, Andrew, I never really had a Charlie Parker. Not so subtly telling Andrew what he thinks of him. Likely a way of goading him into once again trying to prove his teacher wrong. Because before they part ways, Fletcher offers him the chance to play drums for him again. He's leading a band at the upcoming JVC festival, and his current drummer isn't cutting it. And Fletcher's ploy works. Andrew decides to play, 
but he hasn't necessarily recommitted to sacrificing his humanity. He even calls Nicole to apologize and invites her to the show. Maybe he's thinking about finding a way to a more balanced life, one that includes relationships and also jazz. But she hasn't been sitting around waiting for him. She has a boyfriend now. What's important about this? It's one way to say that some of the damage can't be undone. And in addition, perhaps, Andrew leaves that conversation saying, screw it, and rededicating himself to the cold person he became before losing his spot in Fletcher's band. He rededicates himself to being the kind of person who will prioritize greatness over everything else. It's not a logical decision, because logic says that Nicole wouldn't be sitting around waiting for Andrew to sort his life out. Logic says that if Andrew wants a more fulfilling life with meaningful relationships, the answer isn't necessarily to go back to Nicole. It's to open himself up again so when he finds the next Nicole, he doesn't push her away. But there was never a lot of logic behind Andrew's pursuit to begin with. He didn't truly consider all the costs and benefits, but instead sunk deeper into his obsession, like an addict chasing a high. To get sucked back in again, something needs to again override reason, and the pain of Nicole's rejection likely plays a part in that. Because after lingering on Andrew's disappointment, we cut to him preparing for the final performance. Where, on stage, just before they begin to play, Fletcher tells Andrew that he knows it was him who talked to the lawyer. Andrew is the one who got him fired. Then, Fletcher takes his revenge. He told Andrew they'd be playing Whiplash, but instead, they're playing Upswingin', something Andrew is entirely unprepared for. He struggles through the song, improvising and trying to catch up as best he can. But it ends in humiliation, with Andrew walking off stage and his father running to comfort him. This is the final crossroads where Andrew can make a choice. Family and loved ones or Fletcher. He turns his back on his father and returns to the drums. As Fletcher introduces the next song, Andrew cuts him off, cueing the band himself to play a song he is prepared for caravan. He nails the piece and goes into an extended drum solo. At first, Fletcher is caught off guard, but soon he sees greatness flourishing and encourages it. Was this his plan all along? Was humiliating Andrew on stage one final attempt to push him and see if he comes out the other side stronger? Or is it just dumb luck that Fletcher crossed the line and found the next Charlie Parker? The truth is likely somewhere in between. A complicated mess of Fletcher seeking revenge on the one who betrayed him, while at the same time holding out hope for something incredible. With only a subtle head movement, a nod, and a smile, Fletcher gives Andrew what he's been seeking the entire movie, approval. Andrew smiles back. Fletcher cues him, and he wraps up the solo before we cut to black. A happy ending, right? Andrew finally got what he wanted. But why moments earlier are we given a glimpse of Andrew's father watching him, and his expression is more concerned than proud? Because he knows that Andrew has, for one reason or another, decided to pay the price. He will be the man who turns his back on family in favor of approval from them the ones who deem you worthy or not. It's easy to be hypnotized by the ending and feel it's triumphant, because Andrew is our protagonist, and it's certainly what he's feeling in that moment. But that actually wasn't Damien Chazelle's intent. He told RogerEbert.com, I had always thought when writing the film that the ending had always veered a little more on tragic than triumphant. In terms of a lot of responses to the movie, at least from what I've seen, the ending seems to be interpreted as a little more triumphant than tragic. Again, that's not something that I'm upset about. If anything, it makes the movie more enjoyable for people. But it has been a really interesting thing to observe. I had always intended it to be a pretty dark ending. And later, he added, I don't think Andrew physically dies, but I think a big part of his soul has definitely died. Which is exactly what I see on his father's face here. He's mourning the death of his son's soul. So is greatness worth the price of admission? In my view, Whiplash is a cautionary tale, so it purposefully took things too far so that in Andrew's case, he is paying too high a price. He'll likely end up as one of the greats, 
but at the cost of being happy. The pursuit of greatness is undoubtedly admirable, but this movie reminds us that it can be taken too far. The important thing is to be aware of what it can cost you, in part by seeing the things Andrew and Fletcher sacrifice in the process. Be aware of them and consider them, rather than taking for granted that all should be sacrificed at the altar of greatness. Andrew never gave a coherent explanation for what he wanted or why. Maybe if he better defined his goals and actually weighed them against his other priorities, he could find the right balance for him. Maybe there's a version of this story where he stays with Nicole, but continues playing the drums while sacrificing some less important things, skipping college parties, missing some hangouts, and being pickier with what he watches on TV. Maybe someone will outperform him by also sleeping less, or living in self-imposed solitary confinement next to their drums. But maybe that's okay, because all Andrew has to do is look at Fletcher to see his future and see that being the best doesn't necessarily mean being happy. Whiplash is one of my favorite movies in recent years. It's a drama that tackles a meaningful issue, but not in a way that feels bleak and joyless, the way cautionary tales often can. Instead, it's the sort of thriller you can't look away from, which is the most important part of a story. All the meaning in the world is lost if your audience doesn't want to watch. But once you have us watching, we'll pay attention, we'll listen, and we might get a little perspective. I think we can wrap it up there. Let me know your thoughts on Whiplash in the comments, and let me know if there are any other movies you'd like me to cover in this series. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon for more. With that, thank you for watching, and see you on the next One Take.